Hello, we're back. In episode 43, I actually said I'd be working on my Playdate game, Rescue, until I finished it and then returned to my journey. Well, anyhow, I got frustrated, and so I decided to take on Z80 Assembly on the Timex Sinclair 1000, aka the ZX81 for our friends in the UK. I'll be cross-compiling it on a Windows PC using Notepad++ for editing my code and the TASM assembler. I've made several attempts at this before with no luck until I stumbled upon this ebook, Assembly Language on the ZX81, an updated getting started guide by Timothy Swenson. He walks you through setting up the TASM assembler, then slowly explains how to program in Z80 assembly, one step at a time. There are some broken links and missing files and a few typos in the book. But with the help of the Sinclair ZX World Forums, I was able to learn enough ZX80 assembly from Timothy's book to create a decent port of my Invader game demo. Also, this page here on Z80 instructions and addressing modes was invaluable. This version is also very special to me, like the Commodore 64 version, as this was the first computer I ever owned back in 1980. I mentioned this in my first episode. I want to show you how I came up with the images that I use for the invader, turret, and projectiles, and how this all works. I mentioned before, back in episode 3, that the early Sinclair computers were black and white, did not have sound, and did not have reprogrammable characters. So you have to create images with the simple graphic characters that are shown on some of the multi-use keys on the keyboard, shown here. Let's bring up a larger image of the keyboard, as you can see, some of these keys have up to five different uses. But since I will be working on a PC, I don't have to worry about that. I learned BASIC on this machine back in 1980, and I'll tell you, typing in programs on this keyboard took patience. The one saving grace was that a lot of BASIC keywords are only a single button press, as you can see here on the top of the keys. It was pretty brilliant, actually. That's how they were able to sell this machine for $99. Basically, each of these characters can be broken up in quarters in various ways. The first four have the quarter drawn in, in one of the four corners. The next four have half of the characters drawn in, either left, bottom, top, or right. Then these four, down here, have three quarters of the character drawn in, and they are inverted versions of the four above them. Then the last two here on this line have two quarter sections drawn in diagonally, one leaning to the right and one leaning to the left. With just these characters, you can create all kinds of interesting shapes. There are a few more down here that have shaded areas in them. I won't be using any of these for this example. The Sinclair has 24 lines of 32 characters, so if we could split these in half on the X and Y, we would end up with an effective resolution of 64 by 48 pixels, if you want to call them that but you still have to move these characters on character boundaries. Looking at this screen that I showed back in episode three with some different sized invaders created with the characters on the Sinclair, here is the official invader. Although it's missing one line in here, it's supposed to be a little taller, like this. Then there is my eight x eight version, then my tiny one that I use for the thummy as the screen is so tiny. So I thought I'd be using the small invader for the Sinclair, but he was even too large. Remember, our screen resolution effectively is only 64 by 48 pixels. The thummies is 72 by 40, so it's a little bit wider, but not as tall. So first I use GIMP to mock up some ideas for my simplified invader images. This is my invader I created for the thummy version. He ends up being three characters tall. Remember, these are made up of two characters that are divided up in quarters. So this would make up a character. This would make up a character, and unfortunately we would require another character just to show his little feet. So I just removed his little antennae, and now he's only two characters tall, but he's still three characters wide. And I'm only using five pixels because he needs a center to shoot a single pixel wide shot from. Same as the turret, as you can see here. I grade these in to show the whole character, so things have to be created with that in mind, or it doesn't line up. And look right. So this is how the invader and turret are built. Of course I'm showing them separated here so you can see the individual characters. See they are compatible with each other and they line up. The invader takes a total of six characters and the turret takes two. If instead I had built the turret like this, you could see that neither one of these shots would be able to line up with the turret's barrel. 
This final image shows my very simple but effective explosion frames. I'm staying inside the frame area that the sprites occupy before exploding, to keep it simple. The turret actually has two frames. Here are some of my scribbles I use to help me figure out how to build the large invader with the keyboard characters. And here is one I used to help find the spot on the bottom of the invader that I could use to trigger collision. So if the turret's bullet enters any one of these three characters from the bottom of the invader, that would be a collision. Okay, so now that I have explained how the graphics work, let's take a look at the Z80 assembly code in Notepad++. So here's my code. It's over a thousand lines with a to-do list here at the top. I still have three unfinished items, but it was playable and I wanted to get this video out. I still need the ability to restart. I'd like to random restart the invader in his X position. I need to stop the auto fire. I'd like to have a title screen with a big animated invader if possible. So here's what the actual code looks like. I also moved my constants variables and my initial placement of the score and remaining lives. The invader and turret sprites are also done in this file. I'm calling them sprites, even though technically they aren't the proper definition of a sprite, as a sprite can move over a fixed background independently. Before we run this, I want to show you some of my initial tests before finding the best way to move a group of characters like you would a sprite across the screen on the Sinclair. This one is from the program that I showed back in episode 3 with three different invaders. I want to show you what the code looks like in BASIC in order to display these on the screen so you can see how the characters are placed in these print statements. This second one also in BASIC shows just how incredibly slow it would be to move a 3x2 character across the screen in BASIC. And here's what the code looks like. Now we'll look at some assembly versions. This is still kind of choppy as I'm not writing directly to the screen memory. I'm still using an assembly print call instead. Still see that it's kind of flashing and popping as it moves across the screen. I'm still using the print call here and you can see how much the invader flickers and the turret movement is terrible as the routine for moving and animating the invader is interfering with the turret's ability to move. I'll come back to this after we look at the invader running. Once I figured out how to place the characters by writing directly to the screen's memory, things got a whole lot faster. Also notice how long it takes for the invader to actually show up on the screen. We'll come back to this one shortly. This is going to be a big surprise. Anyhow, let's go ahead and run the game. We start out with the turret in play, and we have two in reserve in the upper right hand corner. Look at how smooth the turret and evader move now. No more popping and flashing. Okay, this is our last turret. Let's score one more point, and then we'll get hit, and it's game over. So there it is. So now we'll go back and look at that last file we skipped over before. This is a full arcade pixel perfect invader. 
It's eight characters wide and six tall. That's 48 total characters to draw and move around the screen. It's too big, but I just wanted to show you how fast you can move something on this little machine if you use assembly. And I've slowed it down, otherwise it moves so fast it's just a blur. Okay, here's my Timex Sinclair 1000 with the 16K RAM pack attached. Here it is displayed on the television, and this is my Max Duino Ultimate. It's a digital drive, and you can see Invader.p is showing up on there. Okay, so we're going to hit load, and then shift, and a couple of quotes, and hit enter, and then we'll hit start start on here and you can see it loading and this takes a while meanwhile there's nothing on the display okay looks like we're about ready and there we go now I got this set up for traditional like a PC keyboard with WASD so we're moving left and right and we're firing look at this this thing is running great on here on a real hardware Okay, let's take a hit here if we can. It's actually kind of hard. There's one. So we lose a turret there. And let's see if we can get hit again. Oh, there's a second one. Let's score another point if we can. There we go. And we'll take another hit. And that should be game over. So these Sinclair computers didn't have a power button on them. You literally had to disconnect them from the power and plug them back in in order to reset them. And there's the command prompt. So we'll go ahead and do another load. We're going to try our big invader now on here. Okay, there he is. Let's see how quick he moves around on the screen on real hardware. Look at that. That's insane. Look at the size of this thing. It's like the size of a large calculator running at 3 megahertz. And I can move that great big sprite across the screen. Smooth silk. So, next episode, I will be showing the port of Invader to the Atari 8-bit computers. That includes the Atari 400, 800, and the Atari 600XL and 800XL. I'll be programming it using C with the CC6565 6502C compiler, like I did with the Commodore 64. Well, that about wraps up episode 44 of my journey in game programming. Please like and subscribe, and leave any comments or suggestions you may have that could make these a better experience. Until then, bye. I'll talk to you next time.